Hi, welcome. I'm Christian. Welcome to Lazy Desk. Welcome to our Pico 8 tutorial about how to make a roguelike. I have good news, everybody. I'm recording this episode for the second time because the first time my recorder stopped recording. Why is it good news? Because I know exactly what we're going to do today. But first of all, I wanted to thank one of our listeners. Uh, I posted the first, v the first four videos and got some really positive feedback. One uh, little comment from Tobias Langhoff was very important and he uh, mentioned that the way I explained um, some of the tiles is not entirely correct or it wasn't precise enough. So um, <laughs> it's funny because I made the same mistake <laughs> last time I recorded. <laughs> Um, so he pointed out that I was talking about this tile is transparent um, and it's important to remember that this tile is only transparent when you use it as a tile in a map, when you actually draw it on here and you can tell if I start drawing it, it it's, it's not visible, the, the cross doesn't show up. That doesn't mean that this tile is lost. Um, because I can still use this tile, for example, as a character sprite and use the SPR to draw it on the screen. It's still possible to, to make pixels that are stored in this tile appear somewhere. It's just if I use it here in, uh, as a tile in a map, that makes it transparent. Um, so I could, like, for example, start with the characters here and, and then have the tiles at the bottom of the screen. But I kind of like having the tiles in our, my, our first, the, the floor tiles and the environment tiles, having them in the first... Um, first tab. I think that's cool. Not, a, not a too big of a deal. I don't think we're going to run out of tiles in this project. Good. Um, so today we are going to be, um, if you look at our character, uh, we are going to, there's two things that we're going to fix today. One is that the character is not turning around if you go left and right. I think there's, that's a very easy feature to implement. We're going to start with that one. Uh, the more difficult one is going to be the character actually, you know, not being able to walk through walls like it, he can do right now. So we're going to start implementing some gameplay features. And also, um, this will also go hand in hand with us star starting to pull apart um, structures of that we set up um, so far. Make sure that each function um, does its just one thing and its own thing, and not like one function doing lots of things at the same time. Um, we also is going to start thinking about animation systems. Lots of things to do. Let's start with something very easy, and that is going to be. Um, making a character turn around. Um, that's something that's quite easy to do in our draw sprite function here. Uh, we're using the SPR function to draw the character. And that function actually um, allows you to actually flip um, the sprite. So um, there's a bunch of um, arguments that this function accepts. If you look, at on, look it up on the wiki, you can look up what you know and what kind of arguments there are. Uh, one one means um, the size of the sprite. We could make the sprite span multiple tiles here in our tile map, but um, that's not something that we're gonna do. We're gonna just pl plug in the ones just so we can go get to the to the slot that we're interested in. This is the next slot. This is when we set it to true. You will see the character is gonna be show flipped. And we can also make him flip in a different direction if you want to, woo, crazy. Um, so we are just interested in this slot. And so we're gonna actually use, uh, we're going to accept our draw sprite function will accept another um, another argument that's going to be the flip argument and we're just going to plug the flip argument right in here. So um, what we have to do now is we're going to actually remember our character will remember if he's flipped or not. We're going to start false and then we have, when we're drawing the character Here, oops, I broke something. Always checking out if my recording is still going because man, I am not gonna record this a third time. I will record it a third time around, but I will be very, very mad. Okay, so now uh, we're passing on this flip um, a variable that our character has into the our draw function, but of course now nothing will happen because we're not actually changing this flip variable yet. And we're gonna, of course, change this variable when we press a button. So it's gonna be here. And it's gonna be something like very easy. We're gonna go if dx is smaller than zero, then uh, p flip equals true. So if we're going to the left, <laughs> I remember correctly now because it's flipped for me. <laughs> so if we're going to the left, that means uh, dx is negative. We're 
the numbers are getting smaller. The dx is like the difference of the of our movement. So the dif if that's negative, if the numbers are getting smaller, we want the character to be sh show up flipped. Else, <clears throat> else if actually in this case dx is greater than zero, then p flip equals false. Why greater than zero? Uh, I want to have this where if we're looking in different directions and we move up, I want the character to stay, you know, to keep looking in the same direction that he was looking in um, before we moved him up and down. I want him to kind of like remember his direction. It's something that I, I look, I, I feel, I think is good. But if you don't like this, you can just go with else here. That's, that's fine too. So you can see left is good, right is good. We're looking left and right. And then if you look, go up and down, he stays flipped in whatever direction he was flipped in before. That's what something I wanted. First function done, that was very easy. Now we're gonna get to the part that is more difficult. So we're gonna talk about something that I, I, I hinted at already a little bit. So I'm gonna create a new tab and that tab is gonna be about gameplay. I don't like the term gameplay. I think gameplay is a bit of a, uh, I like it and don't like it. I, what I like about it, it's kind of like, um, it's a very useful term that you can just drop in a conversation and it seems like you know you, you can get people very easy to understand what you're talking about but i think gameplay is kind of like um it means everything and nothing at the same time sometimes we refer to something as gameplay that um that we put things into into one category that um, that are very different things um <clears throat> nevertheless i think gameplay is going to be the part where it's like where it's, it's going to be the rules that are that are running the game and that's where those things going to go in this uh, tab um, things like, for example, that's what we're going to do now, is where a character, what kind of tiles the character may is allowed to step on and what kind of tiles he's not allowed to step on. Now, let me explain real, real quick um, a system that we're going to use for this. So again, I, a very important part of this tutorial is us using this tile system, this map system that's built in, into Pico 8. A very useful system, I, I would say. And it has like this mysterious mysterious area of lamps here. These are lamps that are, you know, saved for every tile in this tile map. So, you know, I can turn on some of the lamps and then I can turn other lamps for this tile. And if I flip around, you know, these, these tiles light up, like every tile has its own lamps. So this is its own pattern of lamps. These lamps are called flags and they are basically like markers or, or switches that um, send information that allow us to store some additional information about the tile. What this information is, is not something that is built into Pico, that's something that we're gonna figure out um, in our code. So it's gonna be up to us to decide what the lamps mean. But Pico 8 provides us with just a bit of a, you know, like a notepad basically, or like a way of, of keeping, no, keeping track of some additional gameplay information that is associated with the individual tiles. Really cool. I like it a lot. A bit more crypt. It's a bit cryptic, so it's something that's not like immediately understandable. Um, so that, that's a bit of a criticism I have here. Like also the UI is kind of weird because it's like right underneath drawing. So you think like you're you're manipulating maybe something that's that you're drawing here on the map. That's that's. But you know it's pretty great. It's 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 just 128 pixels. There's just so much you can do. So what are we going to do? Is you're going to start using some of those flags, some some of those things. I'm going to use the flag zero, that's the red flag. We're going to turn that flag on for all of the tiles that are solid, for all of the tiles that um, do not allow you to pass through them, uh, that should stop the player. In our case, we, you know, we just have a bunch of tiles here. All of these tiles are actually walkable except from this one. So for this one, we're going to click on here and turn on this, this one flag. Okay, and of course, it's now for us to kind of like use this flag in, a, in code to make like the gameplay um, work differently. I'm gonna save this real quick. Okay, so let's go back to the code and let's start making this tile work. Now, you, you see now that this update game function is starting to do a lot of things at the same time. And that's something I already hinted at. Generally, when you write code and you wanna organize your code, you kind of want to find ways of organizing the code so each function just does one thing it just it does the thing that it says on a tin and it 
doesn't try to do like multiple things at the same time and you know especially when you start doing things that belong to different categories so for example you actually really don't want a function to be changing gameplay and then also doing some animations that seems like ugh. Because then if you change the gameplay, you're also changing animations or, or if you want to change animations and that has like impact on gameplay, you want, don't want things to be entangled like this. You want to like disentangle them. Um, not necessary for the coding reason, not necessary because that's like faster or anything. It's just for you, for you as a person. Like, as I said, most of the things that you're coding, you're coding for yourself. <laughs> the computer doesn't care. The computer doesn't, really doesn't care about, you know, how the code is structured. So it's for you to not, not uh, go mad about trying to find all the little bits and pieces, functions that, that govern animation, that all of them are kind of like, you know, labeled correctly and, and structured correctly. So uh, when I see something like this, I get like, this is, this is the sinking feeling where you have to be like, oh, we are gonna have to rip this a little bit apart. And we are going to rip this apart. Okay, so we're gonna create a function that is about moving a character because this function checks button presses then it moves the character, it then affects gameplay, and then it does a bunch of stuff with animation. That's kind of like, it does three things at the same time. This has to be at least three different functions. <laughs> uh, even more probably, we're gonna see that's probably gonna be even more. So let us start pulling all this functionality apart a little bit, and you will see how this will uh, give us suddenly some room, give us, uh, give us more confidence to actually um, uh, keep expanding this functionality. Okay, so we're going to create a function. I'm not sure how I called it last time around, but I think this time around I'm going to call it move player. And it will accept, accept two different arguments. Uh, the arguments are going to be just like how far to the left, right, up, left, down, you know, just like where, what is the, of, of how many tiles you want me to move myself. And we will expect that this is going to be, you know, minus one, zero, or plus one max. And here where we're pressing the button, when we found out which button we pressed, we're just gonna go something like move player, and then just like plug this stuff directly into my veins, yes. And all of this stuff, we don't need that stuff anymore, except for return. And suddenly this update function got like really nice and compact. It's just like looking all the buttons, and if a button was pressed, move the player, we're done. Now here is where we gonna be like, okay, we don't care about how the player was moved. If the button was pressed, or maybe there's some kind of gameplay reasons why he was moved, maybe it's like some kind of explosion moved them. We're just gonna see if this movement is possible. And if it's possible, then we're gonna fire the right uh, animation. Now you can already see that this is still too many functionality at the same time, because we are doing some gameplay stuff. This part is, for example, gameplay. We are changing the position of the where the player actually is on the map, and now we're actually going to actually start like interacting with the with the map and see, you know, if the tile that he wants to move to is actually walkable or not. And then down here, that's actually has to do with animation and how the sprite looks and everything. That's actually a completely different area of expertise. So this will become more functions later on. Okay, so how are we gonna rewrite this a little bit? Uh, so we wanna check the flag of the tile that we are moving to. We're gonna see if this, if this red lamp is on for the tile that we're about to move towards to. And if it's not on, then we're not gonna do any moving. Uh, other way, if it's on, if the t flag, if the lamp is on, if the red light is on, then there's not gonna be any moving. Okay, so first let's grab the coordinates of the tile that we're moving to. Something like dest x, destination x, equals p underscore x plus dx. So that's our destination. Now um, that's, we have to do the same thing for, uh, for y. Again, dx and dy are like you know, how many tiles we're moving into each direction. That's something that we figured out from from the key that was pressed. Oops, there's something wrong here. Okay, and this is good. Uh, we're gonna put all of these things, we already saw this before, into one line because they kind of belong together. And we, want to, we are stingy about, about tokens. 
So now we have destination y and destination x. Uh, let's just now continue and be like, okay, let's try to find out which tile is on that on in that spot. Um, we're gonna call this uh, variable TLE, and we're gonna go like m get dest x dest y. M get is a function that just returns a tile on the map map get uh, at a at a given map coordinate. So dest x and dest y are the coordinates where we're going to, and we're grabbing the tile that is on this coordinate. So you, if you, for example, if you if you look at here, that's position five four x is five and y is four. If you if you go m get five four, it will return the wall tile, and the wall tile is here um, tile number two. So m get five four will will return two five four. Yeah. So now we have the tile. Now we have to. Uh, now that we have the tile number, we have to check if um, the flag zero, the red lamp, was set for this tile or not. So we're gonna go with something if uh, f get flag get tle zero equals true. Something like this. Uh, so you might be wondering at this point, it's like, okay, that seems like, why are we, why is this like, why we're using those lamps? Wouldn't be like easier, like just to see if TLE equals two, that's a wall, right? Why do we have to like check the lamp? Well, the reason for this is later on, we maybe have like lots of different tiles that are walls, right? Maybe there's, there, there, sometimes there's like a, um, uh, you know, we had like these kind of like um, midnight dungeon example where there's lots of different tiles where the walls were curving and, and you know corner tiles and stuff like that. So they look different, but they functional function functionally they're the same. Um, so in this case, we actually want to be agnostic about which specific tile we are talking about. We're just talk thinking about what kind of functionality this tile has, and these kind of um, these flags allow us to kind of like encode functionality into the tiles. Good. So we're getting the tile, um, the lamp, the lamp red, the red lamp, the lamp um, number zero from the tile that we found is our destination tile. And if that's true, if the lamp is uh, on, then that's a wall. If it's not on, it's a free space, then we do it all the moving. Now this little detail here is we can remove this. Look at our tile count, 286, uh, our token count, 286 down here. 84. We save two tokens just and it's functionally the same thing, right? Because you know, we can just plug in true or false directly into an if statement. Very important to keep track of those things as you code because like later on going through an entire code, you know, of like almost 8,000 tokens and trying to find little spots where you can maybe save some um, some tokens is going to be very tedious, so it's very important. Or it might be important to have like certain practices, certain tricks internalized so you can like um, write compact code as you go as you get more experience with pqa8 that, that's not something that you have to be worried about when it's like your first pqa8 game right good so let's run this and you see now i can't actually interact with um with the walls i can actually walk to a tile i'm pressing up again and it doesn't let me do this this is not good this is something that i don't like this is something that now we get to game design parts. And then, you know, that's kind of, like, kind of like game programming for you. Every now and then you have to stop and think about game design. It's very bad, I think, if a game doesn't react to, to inputs that in other contexts would be correct, but just in this case, it are not correct. Um, it's very bad if the game is not providing you any feedback. I think that's kind of like a worst thing that you can do as a game designer. Uh, why? Um, because games, to my in my mind games are like these very creative things they're fun things right they're supp supposed to be fun to interact with um with um with, with those programs and not receiving any feedback is very unfun the game should always be responsive to what you're whatever you're doing it should always give you like an idea what you're doing you should never be confused about what you're doing <laughs> there is some there's a really good example a really cool anecdote where <laughs> one of my students made <laughs> made a game 
Uh, they were, they were, I'm not laughing about them. It's just like a funny example. Um, this was their first PQ8 game. It's, it was great, um, but uh, they made it this shooting game where it's like a you know like a first person kind of shooting game where it's like a reticule and you move it around the screen and there's like enemies walking by like a light gun shooter basically, but without the light gun but just with with, um, with uh, buttons, and they made this ga that game where you would only the the gun would only shoot. If the reticule was over the enemy, so you would only shoot if you would actually hit the enemy. It wouldn't shoot if you would miss the enemy. So you would move the the reticule and you start pressing the buttons. Like, oh, the button's doing nothing. I guess I will press the other button. That's do, also doing nothing. I guess I cannot shoot in this game. Like, why is the reticule then there? Like, it, it was very it's very confusing uh, usability issue, and you had to like step in and say, no, 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 no. You just have to aim better. <laughs> And it, uh, even even if you knew that that problem, it was still, like very, very um, unsatisfying to play this game because you know shooting shooting games especially are about this. You know it's fun to shoot the guns. You know it's, I'm not a big proponent of guns, but I cannot uh, I cannot argue with the fact that you know guns are like da -da 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 -da, you know they're fun to shoot, and it doesn't really matter if you will hit or not. It's cause it's it's kind of like spraying bullets and 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 shooting around things. It's kind of like that's the fun of of those games often. So um, not allowing to you to shoot unless you actually hit was, like, I think, a bad choice. And this is kind of like a similar situation where, yeah, sure, I press the wrong button. You're not supposed to walk to the wall. But I think the game should give you like, feedback like, OK, I try to do the thing, but it doesn't work. You know, So I want to have like an animation, <laughs> very long explanation. I want to have like, an animation where the character actually tries to go there, but then it gets like, uh, rejected by the wall, kind of bumps back. And it's also good to have like this kind of like functionality built in because later on we're gonna maybe re interact with doors or enemies. So we want actually the character to have different animations being played depending on what you do. Okay. Now this is an issue for the way we set up things. So you see that uh, we have like this P turn, right? This this thing here. Then you know this code here is responsible for reducing the offset. You know we have a sprite and it's offset and it gets reduced to zero, so the, the sprite will always catch up with the position of our player. But in this case, we the sprite is not supposed to catch up with the position of the player. It's supposed to go out to where the player is not, and then return. So it's a different animation. This part here will be different. So how are we going to do this? Well, one solution would be maybe to like have a second update p-turn function here. But I think, again, that's kind of like, we have to think ahead a little bit. Later on, we will have more than just one character. We will have also enemy characters and they will be walking around. They will have their own animations. So we actually have to like think about implementing an animation system of sorts or something that we, you know, we have a bunch of characters and we can just like trigger all the animations and the system doesn't actually care. At least this update function doesn't care about what kind of animation is being played. That's something that is being taken care of somewhere else of their own you know, animations. And um, the way we're going to implement this is, I've been thinking about this a little bit, and I think this is a good solution. It's something I'm going to try also later on in the future, where you remember how we had this, um, use this cool trick where you can store a function or a pointer to a function inside a variable. So you can always call the same variable, and that variable will mean different functions, basically. It will redirect to different functions depending on, you know, what kind of state the game is. But you know the update function doesn't care. It just like calls the variable, and the variable can mean th different things. Well, the same thing. The same thing we can use for animation, where we're just gonna have like a variable that stores the animation function, and the update function will just call the animation, and then you know depending on what kind of uh, animation we are currently playing, it will redirect to the different different animation functions. That's something I want to be doing. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to create a new function, a new function, new variable called mmov for move, maybe, or movie. <laughs> I know one called any because we already have any for the sequence. Um, so move, um, that's, that's going to be the variable that stores which kind of animation should, we should play currently for the player that, 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 uh, that is currently that is uh, for, for our player character. Okay, and so now in the update function, 
we just gonna go pmov open close parentheses and this part we're just gonna copy out and and we're gonna uh, put it in its own function all these th other things around it is all go gonna be the same because this uh, advances our animation timer the pt that's the timer that kind of like tells us how far progressed the animation is that goes from zero to one and this checks if the animation is over so you know these are kind of like going to be there regardless what kind of animation we're going to be playing um but then now we're going to actually have different animations so this here's first we're going to recreate our our, our already existing animation p uh, moth walk something like this um i'm not sure where to put it now maybe later on we're going to find a good good tab to find it because it's like it's not the draw that's you know draw functions. It's not tools. It's not a tool. It's an animation, and it's not really gameplay either. So it's kind of like I put it in update because you know it was an update before. But it, maybe it's going to be while we are developing the tabs here. We just have seven tabs, right? It might be worthwhile to think about you know uh, where to put these things. And you know we want to have a second function. Moth. I'm going to call this bump. And this is this animation where the player is moving out to into a tile and then returning. And for now, I'm just gonna plug in the same the same the same code in here. And so here in the gameplay, we have to make sure that we actually remember the animation. So we're gonna p mov equals mov walk, right? This is where we actually moving the character to a new tile. Then we're setting the animation. Oh, you have to remember, we are now assigning a pointer to our function. So we're not have, supposed to have the parentheses. And then when we are colliding with a, with a tile, I'm gonna copy all this co code out with a wall. First of all, we're not changing the position of our player. Flipping is fine. Flipping is a good idea. Actually, flipping is such a good idea that we might put it up here. And, but again, I am a bit apprehensive about this because the flipping, this is move player, this is about gameplay and this flipping of the player sprite, that's not really gameplay, that's actually animation. So. You know, later on we're gonna pull this function apart a little bit. Now, SOX and SOY, that's starting offset, starting uh, in Y and in X direction. Now, again, our bump function will work a little bit differently. Our bump animation. The walk animation has like, you know, the, the player actually move to a different tile and the sprite kind of like catching up with the player. You know, like, the, so the offset is big at the beginning and gets towards zero by the end of the animation. The sprite catches up with the player. With a bump, the sprite is at the beginning where the player is, and then goes out to the wall. So the offset is small at the beginning, gets bigger, and then gets to zero again. Uh, so this SOX and SOY, we're gonna actually use it a bit differently. We know that the offset at the beginning is definitely zero, but SOX and SOY will mean something different for in this animation. In this animation, it will mean kind of like the destination of in which direction the, the sprite should reach out, should like lash out. So I'm gonna remove this minus here because we want to kind of like make the sprite go into the direction where, uh, where we want it to move. T0 is, uh, we actually, hmm, we're gonna keep this T0 around. Uh, and then update p turn is good, but moth walk we're gonna go moth bump. Now remember moth bump is still like the same code as moth walk. We're gonna have to change it for um, in a second. But let's see for now like if this works already. Ooh, it works. Why does it work? We said like we have to lose different animation, but this animation actually already looks okay. Well, if you think about it, it's because we're using the same walk animation, but we actually changed the SOX and SOY. Uh, previously, it was like 
um, the offset was set in the back, like in a different direction from in which direction we are moving. So the sprite can like, I, I just look at the camera and it doesn't actually uh, convey what it I should do like cutouts or something. Ta-da! <laughs> oh, you don't actually see it, it's too bright. So the sprite is usually where the player position is, right? But when we move the sprite, usually, you know, this, the position is actually, you know, location somewhere else. And the sprite has to be moved behind, like it's most, has to be moved in the reverse direction which we moved. So it can then later on catch up with our location because our location jumps out like this and the sprite has to move behind. So what we actually have to doing is like we're jumping both together at location and then reset the sprite behind our movement so it can match, um, so we can catch up. But now what we want to do is like the location, the, the, this one, the location is just stays there. But what, what we actually do want to do is want to have the sprite move out and then return. So we're going to set SOX as Y as a marker of, you know, where we want it to move. So the sprite can move in that direction and then it can return to zero. Man, I messed up my lightning setup just for this, for this little demonstration. I hope that's understandable. So, um, so for this reason, actually, if we run this with the same animation, it actually works because you know our sprite is kind of like reset immediately where we want it to move and then returns to zero. But we want actually the sprite not just like to shoot out and immediately jump to the direction, we want it actually to walk there. And so this bump animation is something we have to rewrite a little bit. Um, so you might remember that you know PT is this animation counter timer that kind of counts how far this animation has progressed. Something I want to do now is kind of like um, make a different animation for the first half of the animation and a different animation for the second half of the animation. So if PT is smaller than 0 0.5, that's the first half of the animation, then do something. Otherwise, do something else. The something else is going to be the returning part. And that's going to be the same thing as the walk, where it's like we're trying to reduce the offset down to zero. Like this, right? Where we're multiplying with, with something that, with, my, I, with one minus pt. And one minus pt is, you know, a number that starts at one and goes to zero by the end of the animation. So if we multiply, if we multiply something with zero, that's zero. So this, this line will make OX approach zero by the end of the animation. <clears throat> but at the beginning of the animation, we want actually to something to start at zero and go out to into, into a direction. So we're gonna copy this one and it's very easy. We just like remove this one minus. Because again, it starts at zero and gets bigger. So we take a number, that's in this case, this is the destination for where we wanna be going and multiply it with a number that starts at zero but grows. So we start at zero and then continue growing because you know this, this timer starts at zero and continues growing. It's my explanation for this. I cannot explain it any further. It's kind of like math. You kind of have to like wrap, wrap your head around. But you can see it works. You see our character bumping against this wall. Just a little detail that I wanna fix before we move on. 355 is the amount of tokens we have currently. Let's see if we can like rewrite this a little bit more compact. What I see here is a bunch of code that basically is very similar and there's a lot of like brackets and brackets cost, you know, even a bracket costs, a bracket costs, uh, costs tokens, right? So there's a way of making this a little bit, a little bit um, shorter. Um, I'll call TME for time equals PT. And we're gonna just like do this assignment once. Now it's bigger than zero five, then P, uh, TME equals P uh, one minus PT. Because all, it, all that changes is just the just this like um, this little helper number that show, tells us how far this animation has progressed. Okay, so let's see if this works. It works. And you can see that we saved uh, almost 10 tokens, nine tokens. That's good. Good, 
so far so good. We have like one, one our bump animation. Now the thing that I want to be doing in the next episode, it's still recording. I'm glad. <laughs> the thing I want to be doing in the next episode, is start um, continuing this 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 thing here. So we can now bump against certain walls. That's good. But we talked about how maybe certain things are things that we can interact with. I, I want to have like more agency in this world. So for example, I want to be able to bump against the door and maybe open it up. That would be like kind of like an obvious next thing. Or maybe step on the stairs and go to the next level, though that's kind of like already open up a new can of worms where you have to like think about levels and, and stuff like that. Ah, let's do, let's, 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 that's going to be some, some uh, episodes down the line. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments section. So far, the feedback was really positive. I'm really glad that people are enjoying this. And if um, you want to see the code, if you are kind of like are lazy or if you got stuck somewhere, didn't see something that I wrote down, um, then there's always going to be a link to the code at the end of each episode down in a doobly-doo. And also, if you like, can't wait that long and you don't really want to like play this game and try how what the final uh, result is going to be, um, please visit our Discord. There's a lot of cool discussion going on there, and you will always be able to. Uh, there's already a link up there for you to be able to play the prototype of this game. You can give me maybe some gameplay feedback and see maybe we can change um, change how we program this game as we move on. Thank you so much for joining me. See you next time, around, guys. Bye bye.